All right, sounds good. So welcome everybody. My name is Steve Ostrander. Um, I am the sales rep in the, um, in the Midwest. I cover the camera company. Unfortunately, Ward wasn't able to join us today. He normally would kick things off, but um, he's uh, busy taking care of customers. So hopefully, because he does, he is there at the Odana store from 10 to four every day. So if there's something you need, um, please contact the camera company on Odana Road and uh, they can take care of you. Um, we're gonna let Ken go through his presentation today when we get done towards the end. If there are questions that you have today, as he goes through this, you can put them in the chat section um, on, on the meeting and uh, at the end, uh, Ken will answer all your questions. In the meantime, everything will be muted so that they can get through it, but there will be time at the end to take care of everybody's questions. Um, so without further ado, I am Ken Hubbard. Hey everybody, I want to thank you for attending and just uh, make sure this chat thing is working. Just confirm that a couple of you, you don't, everybody doesn't have to do it as you know, a few of you <laughs> can do it. Just let me know, you can see my screen. You should see uh, the beauty of landscapes there. Just type in yes or something like that, that's fine. Um, and then we can get started. My name is Ken Hubbard. I am from Tamron, USA. I am the field service manager, and what that usually means is that I'm on the road traveling, mm -hmm. teaching classes, doing webinars. Oh, one thing if people can do, uh, put your, on your side, mute on, uh, just in case the dog comes in your room or something like that. So, um, the field service manager for Tamron, so means I'm usually traveling around doing seminars, workshops, educational sort of stuff for Tamron, as well as producing videos for them. I have a team of seven uh, tech reps that we uh, that I also lead that do the same thing. So it's a little different for us right now, like all of you, uh, not to be on the road every second of every day, but it's uh, we've been able to kind of work through this and do presentations a different way. Uh, I just hope everybody has been safe and healthy out there and continues to be that way. And we'll be out there shooting uh, soon enough, I hope, uh, within the next month or two. Uh, just to get started, I'm gonna take care of some um, housekeeping here. I put the lens designation in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen for each picture I've taken. Every single image you see of my, is mine and I put the lens designation so you know what lens I use for it because that will make a difference in your uh, landscape images. So when I talk about DI lenses, I'm talking about full frame, like the 24 to 70 DI VC. That is a full frame lens. The nice thing about full frame lenses is that you can put them on crop sensor cameras and they'll work fine on both. You just have that crop factor of, of whatever camera system you're doing. Let's say you're using a Nikon. This would now be say a 1.5 crop and it would be a 36 to 105 lens. We also make for crop sensor cameras. So if you have one of those, if you see DI2, like the 18 to 400 DI2, that would be designed for your crop sensor. If you put that on a full frame, unfortunately, the circle of light that comes out of the back of that lens isn't large enough to fill the sensor of a full frame camera, so you'll get darkening in the edges, vignetting in the edges. Nikon full frames does have a feature that has an auto crop feature that allows you to put it on there. It'll recognize it's a DX lens or a DI2 in our case, and it will crop the sensor automatically. Uh, and you can use it, but yeah. You know, and we also make for the mirrorless systems, Sony, Panasonic, and Olympus. So if you see DI3, like 2875 DI3 or 18 to 200 DI3, that would be designed for mirrorless systems. Uh, so we do make it for that as well. With that being said, let's get into this uh, presentation. 
landscape photography may seem simple. It may seem like, okay, you go out there, you, you bring your lens and your camera, your tripod, your shutter release cable, all that fun stuff, maybe some circular polarizers, neutral density filters. If you're like me, uh, your backpack is filled with so much gear, it ends up weighing about 35 pounds. Uh, but, you know, better be safe than sorry to do what you want. <laughs> but there's a little bit more to <laughs> landscapes, excuse me. There's a little bit more to landscapes. Uh, it's seeing, it's finding, it's light, it's finding your own style as well. Some people are wide angle shooters. They love the wide angle look of an image where that foreground looks really big, the background gets pulled away. Um, dyma dynamic images can be created that way. And then there are some that are telephoto shooters. They'll shoot the 28 to 300 or 18 to 400 at 400 millimeters and find those little pieces within a grand landscape that a lot of people don't see. And I'll admit, uh, I'm more of a wide angle shooter. And on one of my workshops, the Bryce Canyon, a guy was shooting the 150 to 600 in Bryce Canyon. And I'm sitting there going, wow, what, is, what are you getting with that? And he showed me some truly astonishing images of just little parts of the canyon as the sunrise as the sun came up peeked over the the horizon the light hit just this one tree that was carved in an arch that with your eye you can't see but you saw it with the 150 to 600 and it was a beautiful image so finding your own style is is a key and also do you like black and whites do you like color do you you know what is it that you like? Try everything. Um, learn from a lot of people. Try, if you know landscape photographers that you truly love, look at all their images. And if there are some that are specific, try to recreate it yourself. And the more you do this with the more different photographers and the more different books you look at, the more you start taking pieces from each of these people and start creating your own look and style to what you're doing. First off, let's talk about changing your field of view, both by perspective and focal length. Focal lengths will be first. There is a huge difference between the 18 millimeters and 400, between wide angle and telephoto. Wide angle, like I said, what it does is it takes that foreground element, makes it really big, kind of larger than life, and then the background kind of fades away long, so you can get some really dramatic images where telephoto say in this case with 18 to 400, at 400 millimeters, it does the opposite. The more magnification, the more compression, the more foreground and background elements look like they're closer together. And that could be a key element into the way things look. And so there, I know a lot of people, and I know my family and friends sometimes think, is it really that hard to take a good landscape? I go, um, even if the conditions are perfect, it can be difficult because sometimes there's a lot of elements in there and you get overwhelmed by it. So, you know, think about what lens you want to use and is this a wide angle shot? Is this a telephoto shot? Is there better, is there something more interesting really close and zoomed into? Or is there something more interesting um, than the wide angle? So let's move on. So here, as you can see, 18 millimeters, you get a little bit of everything. 400 millimeters, you're super up close. You know, it all depends. And it's not just those extremes as well. Even with wide angle lenses, like a 15 to 30, there's a, there is a big difference between 15 millimeters and 30 millimeters. In this case, I shot this original shot at Red Rock Crossing in Arizona with Cathedral Rock in the background and the river coming through. It's kind of, it's an okay shot, but to me, there's a little too much distraction from the side trees and a little too much foreground that has nothing going on in it. 15 millimeters stretch things out a little bit too much. But at 26 meters, not even going to the full 30 millimeters, took out that side, created a little bit more compression, not so, such a drastic stretched out look, I also changed my perspective, not just by the focal length, I also moved closer to the ground. The previous shot, I was sort of standing mostly straight up. Now I kneeled down, got closer to that one pool of water, 
to get a better reflection and fill the foreground in that. So a big difference between that, you know, it's okay, but this to me is much more dramatic. Also having the moon in it's kind of cool too, but uh, just you can see that effect, such a, a, a little bit of focal, look, focal length difference makes a, a much different shot. But sometimes, obviously, you need that wide angle. This is Horseshoe Bend in Arizona. And to go there, you really do need to bring the widest angle you have. I shot this with 24 millimeters, I've shot it with 30 millimeters, but it never quite has the same impact because you're cropping off too much of the sides. Um, and for me, it's, it, it works as the widest angle you could possibly shoot with it. Uh, for years, I went to this location. I've been going there for about 26, 27 years. And for the first few, I won't say how many, but for the first few, I always went for sunrise. It just seemed like a great sunrise spot and never was truly, truly satisfied with the images I got. Sometimes, you know, if there was a storm in back, it was good or something like that. But most sunrises, I was like, eh, you know, it's okay. Went to go have lunch one day at one of the local restaurants, sat down and uh, the waiter comes over and he's just like, oh, you guess you've been shooting. He saw the camera over at Horseshoe Brand and I'm like, you know, you really should go at sunset. He's like, yeah, you know what? After all these years, I've never actually been there at sunset. Went there that sunset and I haven't looked back going at sunset. It, it definitely is a place that works for me a little better at sunset. So where sometimes it's totally wide, other times it is totally works better as a telephoto. And in this is Delicate Arch in Arches, Na uh, Delicate Rock in Arches National Park. And the first inkling you have is, wow, these guys are big. I need a wide angle. I got to get up close to this and, and, you know, try and capture everything. Problem is when using a wide angle, you gotta get really close to it and you start looking up. And the minute you start looking up, what do you get with a subject like this? Convergence, it starts going in like that. And anything in the background looks so far away, you can't even tell what, what's going on back there. Is there any details or is there anything interesting back there? So in this case, I went across the street, took the 70 to 200 at 200 millimeters, and because now I moved away, my angle of view goes from looking up to looking straight, the rock straighten out. And because of the compression at 400, you can now see turret arch in the background in the bottom left, as well as the mountain range gets closer and, and larger in the background, creating maybe a little bit more interesting. And as far as composition goes, I used the least amount of sky possible and it fills the most amount of sky possible because there's no clouds. It's a cloudless sky. The light was really nice. You can see how pink it was, but would have been even better if I had some, some clouds in there. But, you know, when you can fill some of that negative space with, with a subject, you know, it takes over and it becomes a little better. This is even to more extreme in this case. This image was shot with the 150 to 600 and sometimes timing and the situation you're in, you are in dictates the lens you're gonna lose, use. I was in Apalachicola, Florida, actually on a boat on the Shrimp Creek, I believe it is, uh, taking photos of bald eagles and osprey. So yeah, I was using a 150 to 600 for birding. That's what I had in my hand. And as we turned a corner in the river, the sky just blew up this really beautiful orange because they were doing some controlled burns in a local state park. So all that particulate and smoke was going in up in the air. And as the moon, as the sun, sorry about that, as the sun started setting, it just became this incredible, incredible orange color. So I used this 150 to 600 at 600 millimeters, even more compression where the clouds, the silhouetted trees, the sun kind of look like they're on that same plane. A completely different perspective because of the focal length I used. If we were closer to those trees and I was using say in the 24 to 70 at 24 millimeters, the sun would be smaller, the clouds would there would be some separation. Not sure if it would have the same feel, feel to it. 
changing your perspective with point of view. Like I showed you earlier with Red Rock Crossing, changing your perspective. Don't always shoot at eye level. I know as landscape photographers, it's very easy to get out of our car, hike to the spot you're going to, set up the tripod, and next thing you know, you're shooting at eye level. It usually starts getting a little bit more interesting when you can change that perspective. If say you can go higher or lower, in this case in Zion National Park, again another cloud, uh, cloudless sky, so I want to minimize the usage of that. So I walk out into the, the Virgin River. Luckily it was um, fall at this point, so the river was pretty low, not much flow to it. I was able to walk out into it and kind of get really, really close. I'm about six inches off of the water at this point and using that foreground rock as my focal point to create a little bit more dynamic image, create a little bit of depth in here, but also since there's nothing going up on here in the sky, you know, you can concentrate on that beautiful gold and blue reflection in the water as well. So I know I'm, I'm getting older and it's getting harder and harder to get back up after crouching down like this, but it, you know, it sometimes it really makes a huge, huge difference in the in the images that you take to just try and kind of change your perspective, but change your perspective as as well as if you have the opportunity to walk around the subject, you know, don't don't shoot it from that main. If you're if you're investigating an area like this is Mobius Arch in the Alabama Hills, just outside of the town of Lone Pine, and there are a few shots where you know, you're, they're shooting through it and you have Mount Whitney in the background through the arch. As you can tell, there were some clouds this day and Whitney was uh, not showing herself uh, at, that, at this point. So I had to change my perspective of how I was gonna shoot this image. Yeah, because I did originally want that in the background, but it didn't work. So fortunately, this is an arch that you can walk completely around 360 degrees to see the different positions, uh, different, light the way it falls on it and this is a nice one the sun just started coming up so I started getting some nice warm highlights some nice soft shadows and in the rocks behind it it's starting to hit there Whitney the whole time we were there just stayed in the cloud so I knew that wasn't going to be the shot here it also looks like it's a bit thicker of an arch as well but when you go to the complete other side of it you can tell you know it's it's actually thinner than it actually looks and then the sun comes up. It was a cloudy day, so it never, you know, peeked through completely while we were there, except for a couple of blue skies you see there. But it kept this nice soft light. So I don't know. I keep going back between this one and this one, which one I like better. You know, whatever day I wake up, it, it tends to be a different one uh, between those two. But the great thing is also, again, perspective and focal length. Like I said, with wide angle, that foreground subject looks much, much larger than it actually is. And it's kind of a cool subject here. I show this to people and they're like, oh, that's kind of a cool arch. You know, can you walk through it? I go, I'm six feet tall. There's no way I'm walking through this arch. I actually got to get down on my hands and knees to go through it. So it looks much larger than it actually is. So that's a neat thing, playing with perspective and focal length as well between those two. Also, always, always work the scene, which means don't just take one picture. You saw with these images, this is only a handful of the images that I ended up taking. As I'm walking around, even if the light is not perfect, I'm still taking pictures, you know, different angles, different points of view. If you go to a location and take one picture, that's it. That's the, the image you, you get. That's the best image you'll get because, you know, that's the only one you took. And I do find it interesting when I'm leading workshops, many, many people tend to do that. They take a picture, maybe a second picture, and then they're like, okay, I'm moving on. You know, I tend to work a scene, walk around, look for different 
points of view, use different focal lengths, change things just a little bit. But here, as an urban landscape in DC, the tidal basin and the cherry blossoms, not in bloom, so we didn't go to get the flowers. We were using them as a silhouetted element in a sky again, and you're starting to see the conditions I work in a lot, a lot, a lot of beautiful days, but a little too beautiful in, in, in the case of the sky. Um, so wanted to use the cherry blossoms as a silhouetted element to fill that negative space and frame the Washington Monument. Fortunately, I had this little duck going by in the water, kind of a neat little scene too. But I started off here, took this one to fill the sky, but yet still be able to frame, find that little arch in those branches to put the monument up into. Then as I'm walking along, I go to the opposite extreme and I just kind of fill everything, except for a little hole that gets the monument through it. Then I'm walking along and I kind of find this one a little nicer balance you know the odd number of branches in there is a little bit more pleasing to the viewer's eye you know that's what they say when you have odd number things in there it works a little bit better than evens it kind of breaks up that space a little bit more pleasing to the viewer so these three branches come in and i kind of like that one even though i was i was really satisfied in this area with that i got the picture i was looking for and you know i did take say 10 or 15 images, different focal lengths, higher, lower, a little bit more uh, reflection, a little bit less. And once I did that, I kept on going. I looked for different, I took out the cherry blossoms completely, went closer to the bridge, that didn't work for me. So in reality, ended up taking, I don't know, 100, 125 images, something like that over a couple of, over an hour, hour and a half of time or so. And ultimately, you know, I come back to this one. And it's not so much I'm trying to take a, a thousand images just to get one. It's just sometimes you go in thinking you know what you want. And I did here, hoping there were going to be clouds this morning, but there weren't. So I had to change my thought process, what was going to happen. So I took a whole bunch of different images and ended up liking this one the most. Create depth with both foreground and background elements. Think about your scene. Construct a scene. Just don't walk up and say, oh, there's my main subject. There's the Grand Tetons. That's what I want the image to be of. An image will be a lot more interesting, even if conditions aren't perfect, if you add other elements to it and to the extreme. Here is Arches National Park again not you know it's the middle of the day i'm a photographer that doesn't stop shooting just because it's the middle of the day i know there's a lot of photographers that say hey go back to the hotel grab a nap yeah there's always time to sleep don't worry you, you can find time to sleep i'm if not photographing for a purpose purpose i'm photographing to scout a location as well that knowing that i'll come back later and hopefully this will be perfect the reason why I shot this one is it's the middle of the day. There's not many people walking around this arch, so I have a clean picture of it. If it's morning or afternoon at sunset, there's people walking around the arches and, and all on the trails there. But I found a piece of this, uh, this I think uh, uh, the remnants of a juniper tree that was just kind of lying on the side of the trail that I was walking on. And believe it or not, it's only about three feet long. It's a, not a gigantic piece of, of branch here, but because I'm using the 10 to 24 in this case at 10 millimeters, and I'm maybe a foot to 18 inches from this branch, I'm able to make it look much bigger than the window arches in the background, which is kind of a, a fun and neat thing. So creating a little bit more depth by really paying attention to foreground as much as your background or whatever your major subject is in the scene. Again, here, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be um, a, a major element, just a little something in the foreground that create a little bit more interest to the image. This is on the island of Kauai in, Hawaii, in the Hawaiian Islands and Hanalaya Bay. I probably pronounced that wrong because <laughs> I, there's not many Hawaiian words that I pronounce correctly. They're, they're pretty tricky for me. Um, but a storm was coming in both from the mountains 
that are straight ahead in this image and to the left. So the light is really dramatic. So I pulled out to the first pullout along this road that uh, I came to and just started firing and tried to keep these two plants in front of me in the frame because this weird light that was going on was hitting them just enough that they were sort of glowing in the foreground. And so it gave a nice foreground element and background element in this case. And it's not just physically what's in the scene, it's the tones that are created in that scene as well that create depth. Here I got a nice highlight in that foreground, something a little bit darker in the middle ground followed by a darker line of bushes there and then some highlights in the mountains then darker mountains again so there's a lot of light dark darker light dark again creating these different steps and tones which create depth and a lot of times when it comes to post-production this is where one of the mistakes people make they try to take all these different tones and equal them out and when you do that, when you equal them out, you lose depth. And that's when we're one of the mistakes uh, in post some people make. So think about that. Even when you're doing your post-production, think about tones in layering for depth. Um, with that being said, I do work on every single image that you see in this presentation. I've been using Photoshop for Oh, 26, 27 years now. And uh, to me, I use it to enhance the images. This is just a process that I do. I try not to over process the images so they look a little hyper real. I try to keep them as natural as possible. And yes, sometimes it's a little bit more saturated. And the way I feel about it is, I think it was, what was it way back when? Uh, the Fuji Velvia 50 was sort of the uh, landscape photographer's dream chrome film because of those rich, rich colors. They were a little bit more rich than were really there. So, you know, don't hesitate if you want to, you know, work on them a little bit. But if you're a naturalist and you like it coming straight out of the camera, that's cool too. I'm not here to say you have to do one or the other. It's your preference of what you like to do. I just think sometimes images need that little extra to, to really make them pop. So here is a Grand Teton and use human elements as well in your landscapes. Landscapes don't just have to be mountains, streams, trees, rocks, branches, all that stuff. This is uh, the barns on Mormon Row in the Grand Teton National Park. And I will admit, sunrise in the Tetons has, has not been my friend until this image. This was the last trip I took last year there. And again, the first two or three mornings, we got skunked, it was rain, it was gray, it was dull. My typical mornings in the Tetons. If you have this situation where, you know, you keep going somewhere or you go, you know, three mornings in a row and you're just like, oh man, this is just not happening for me. Do not get frustrated. Go, continue shooting, try it again because this might happen. It looked like it was gonna rain again. <laughs> and be stormy and gray, but all of a sudden the clouds just started breaking about a half hour before sunrise, and I finally got my really nice, nice, uh, warm sunrise in the Tetons. So don't, don't get frustrated. Remember, photography is supposed to be fun, and especially landscape photography. This isn't brain surgery. This isn't, excuse me, photojournalism in a war zone. This is meant to be fun for us, and the minute you find yourself getting frustrated, just walk away from your camera for a second, take a deep breath, and take in the scene that's in front of you. Just really appreciate it for what it is. Constructing the elements of an image, isolation and inclusion, what you want to keep in an image, and why to take things out. Lines and patterns, use those lines to draw the viewer into the image. What is the compositional emphasis? What are the most important things in it? Color and tone and how they work and light and dark relationships along with that color and tone. So isolation and inclusion. If you have a stream, this is Child's Park in Pennsylvania, great little park. I know it was closed down for a while because it got hit by a pretty bad snowstorm one year and they lost about 200 trees in it, but hopefully it's gonna be reopening soon because I got some great, wonderful little 
very accessible uh, waterfalls. And this is one of them. It has a beautiful little S-shaped curve to it. So I want to include the whole river. You kind of can see the continuance throughout the whole waterfalls. So it made for a nice image having the entire waterfall in it. But then just down the road from Child's Park, or well, a few miles from uh, Child's Park is uh, Bushgill Falls. Uh, it's a privately owned area that has a bunch of waterfalls as well. And this is Bridal Falls, sort of the same type of waterfall where it's a cascading waterfall down. But this one from where you, you can shoot from, you see the top one and you see the bottom one. And there's just too much of a gap that just doesn't look pleasing. So where I included, included the entire waterfall, here I isolated only a section of it. And I think it's a little stronger, especially because with a very slow shutter speed, I believe this was about five seconds, you get that beautiful soft, soft water against that deep, dark rock, almost black rock there. So it, it's dramatic that way, just isolating that small little area using lines and lines could be obvious lines as in a road a set of uh, benches in a park you know uh, a a string on the ground a rope on the ground can be leading lines and sometimes they're just natural leading lines this is redwood national forest and the upper portion of California. And I got up a little late this particular morning because I was staying in a town in Oregon that was known for a couple of good breweries. And yeah, I was out a little bit later than I wanted to. And I got up late and I started driving down to the Redwoods. And you know, by the time I got there, it was like 10 or 11 o'clock. The sun's up, bright light. I figure, you know what, I'll just, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll you know scout for later tonight and tomorrow morning, so I'll be good. I do always keep a camera with a lens on it in the back seat of my car. I just in case, you know, even if I I don't think something's gonna happen, you never know. You really never know what you might get. So in this case, I had a, a crop sensor camera with the 18 to 400 on it, and I'm driving and I kind of I'm up over a hill down into a valley and there's still a layer of fog in there. And because of the time of day, 10:30, 11 o'clock in the morning, the sun is really high in the sky. And as you're driving through it, and the more you get into it, the more these beams of light started happening and immediately pull off to the side of the road in a safe spot, the first safe spot I could see, grab my camera, 18 to 400, and just started firing. I shot for about 15, 20 minutes, different angles, different, but what I love about this one is those beams of light just draw you, draw you into the forest. Um, some people might say, well, why didn't you, you didn't go back to grab your full frame with say your 24 to 70 or something like that? Because you know what? This 18 to 400 did the job. It worked perfect. The image is tack sharp. The tonal range on it is really nice. There's no need to shoot it again with a, a different lens and camera. It, it did the job. So, color tones and lines here. It's a combination of both. You know that 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 sunrise that works out in the Tetons again. That you sit there and you get this this nice color but it's a matter of composition here too it's like where do you put that horizon line with reflections fortunately with the angle that i was shooting at you know i had the line of the snake river going to the tetons but you know i was high enough that i was able to get a decent enough reflection of the tetons and keep that horizon line a little out of the center because compositionally you want to usually keep a horizon line out but with reflections it can be a little tough and this next one shows that this is sunset uh by oxbow bend and this one considering the position of how to get the reflection where i was the angle and the elements that i wanted in it the horizon's a little bit more in the center and don't beat yourself up because of that if the image comes out and looking nice and it's exactly what you want uh, but the horizon line is not using that rule of thirds that, you know, you have to use. <laughs>
it's okay. It's a beautiful image. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine. I mean, uh, sometimes on these workshops, I have people it's like, but I can't get my horizon line. I go, do you like the image? I, and I'll say, I like the image. I think it's really great. Yeah, I think it's good, but you know, then don't worry about it. It's okay. Rule of thirds is just there for a, you know, a guideline to help you out. It doesn't always have to be used. Here's an example of the Bonneville salt flats. And I was driving through and the day before it rained. So there's about six inches of water laying on top of the salt. And it was a really bright day <coughs> and a deep blue sky. And I was just looking at the scene and sometimes I, you know, more often than not, I stop I leave my camera in my camera bag. I, I just look at the scene and try and figure out what it is I want to do. At this particular scene, I was a little, you know, I was like, I'm not quite sure. So I, I shot for about a half hour, different focal lengths, different things, took it back to the computer and was viewing my images and where the other ones are about really nice color, about pink skies and blue skies and pink clouds and reflections in the water and stuff like that this was about minimizing the color there was something about the images that i just didn't care for and that was a distraction of the color in the mountain range and the foreground even though it was minimal the color in the mountains the foreground had a little bit more of the blue sky reflection what i ended up doing is taking away the color or desaturating the image from the mountains down but overall making a bit more contrasty that highlight and shadow making it a little bit more extreme to give it a feel it doesn't have the feel of extreme color doesn't have the moodiness of black and white but it has something that's in between so sometimes it's just finding that color connection and how they work together either to color it or not to color it or take away some or add more you know you never know experiment with your images the great thing with photoshop or lightroom is that you can experiment or whatever program that you're using luminar whatever it is you can experiment with the image and if you don't like it throw it away and start again it's just it it, it it's see where it can go. I remember the first time I got Nick software uh, that enabled you to do a lot of things that took a lot of time doing it in Photoshop. I took that software, this got to be oh, 15 years ago now, 16 years ago maybe, and it was to the stream. I look back at those images and they're, they're almost like clown images at this point. I'm less like, but it was fun experimenting to see what you could actually create with it. So Play with your, your software and see what it can do. Maybe it'll enhance it in a way that you didn't think of. Look for and understand light. Um, really understand light and get to start reading it. And one of the best ways you can do it, you, some of you may have heard this before, is that for say a month, go back to the same location. It doesn't have to be exciting. It could be a building. It could be a single tree. It could be a part of the park that you just like doesn't have to be anything major and if you can pick a different time of day to go there to look at the light see what it looks like in the morning see what it looks like at midday see what it looks like in a storm see what it looks like after a storm because it's always going to be different and being able to repeat that and and notice things the the habits of light what like look light looks at will help you create better images so you know just before dawn light tends to be blue except for that little fringe of warm light that's hitting some of these highlights over here you see all that that blue color that's in it because it's shady shady light or before um sunrise light tends to be that cool bluish color but as the sun rises what happens you get that warm light and you get that directional light where now you have the highlights on the right side the deep shadows here and in the clouds you see more texture in the clouds because of the highlights and shadows that are uh, that are there the warm highlights 
the cool shadows create a little bit more dimension in it. Then again, the same location. This is all Grandview Point in the Grand Canyon. What it looks like in stormy light, completely different. This is because this highlights back here gets silhouetted, but yet there's some light being reflected off the rock in front of me. So creating that highlight there. Really reading light and knowing uh, light is extremely important. You know, that pre-dawn, this is um, this is the Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone National Park. And pre-dawn, it's pretty beautiful. You can walk around there. There's not many people there. This is a one time and one part of Yellowstone National Park that I've been there about three or four times now that is surprisingly quiet. So all 122 of you, if we're there at the same time, it might not be quite as quiet, but just remember this. This is one of the more quiet areas for sunrise in the park for some reason. Um, but here you have part of it that's in that cool light, but just a little bit of stream of sunrise kind of peeking through there. In this particular shoot, we were shooting a video there. And we, when shooting a video, uh, you have to be guided by a park ranger <laughs> and i will tell you she was fantastic she was like the lead ranger for permits and we're meandering through and we're talking we're getting some facts from her we're shooting some videos shooting some stills all this stuff kind of slowly meandering <laughs> and we get to canary canary spring and all of a sudden she kind of leads back and she goes yeah this is one of my favorite spots and right <laughs> Literally, within 10 seconds of her saying that, the sun crested over the peak and blew up Canary Springs with backlight. So all the steam from it starts glowing in the super warm color. The orange, the whites, the pinks from the spring starts glowing and stuff like that. So really knowing time to get those... Uh, apps for your smartphones that will tell you when sunrise is, but also get the apps that have that augmented reality that you can actually see when it will creep up over the mountains that may be blocking it out for a while because sunrise might be technically 7 a.m., but if you're behind a mountain, which this was, it was more like 7.25 a.m., so it's a matter of time knowing when to be there. And I, I will admit, uh, I was with Andre Costantini shooting a video, and we both kind of look at her and go, yeah, you've done this a couple of times, and you know exactly when to be here. She goes, yeah, I guess so. She, she was pretty funny, uh, but I appreciate her doing that. And use, use the locals, be it in Page, Arizona, a local you know, person willing to give you knowledge about Horseshoe Bend or the the rangers of Yellowstone, they're there, they know, they, they see these things. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Leading lines and light here, this is a great example of a leading line that's man-made. This is out near Area 51 as a storm is coming. Uh, we were actually out there for a, a different shoot, but as soon as I saw that storm racing to those mountains on the right-hand side, I ran out to the middle of the road. Luckily, it's in the middle of nowhere, so not many cars come screaming by there and this started firing away and again get apps that can tell you weather if i see a storm's coming and i have the opportunity to be in a certain location as that storm is breaking or going by i get there you know if i know something's going to break and i want to be there when it breaks i get to that spot an hour before the weather you know, says, okay, it should be cleared out by this time because you're usually in for really good light. Also, scenes that might not seem like there's a lot of light, there ends up being a lot of light. Um, I know this is uh, Antelope Canyon, and very early on, people used to say, oh, only go there in, say, May, June, July, August, when the sun is high in the sky, so you get the beams of light, you know, that also brought the crowds. That's what people wanted to see. And they would say, oh, there's not enough light really to get anything interesting in there. Well, that's a bunch of hogwash because any little light in any situation can create something. And here, there is plenty of light because of the colors and, and the amount of light that comes down there in January, December, you can create 
beautiful, beautiful images because it just me might mean you need a little longer exposure, but you'll be able to capture that scene. This was shot in January with the 15 to 30 handheld at, I believe it was about a quarter of a second. Um, did it look this bright there? Nope, but with that quarter second exposure, I was able to draw in enough light to, to capture it. Then there's unnatural, uh, unnatural things that happen such as fires. Fires can be really dramatic and interesting to your images. This is Yosemite National Park and there were three fires outside of the por park and every morning we woke up to this incredible amount of smoke. Uh, the first morning we were just like, oof, uh, okay, I guess we're going for breakfast. The second morning we were determined and said, hey, let's get out there and at least see what's going on. And this time we, it paid off because this is a spot we go a pull out along the river that we go to often. And it was very unique because of the color that was being created from all that smoke, um, unlike any other shot I had. So even under the worst conditions, fires and smoke and stuff like that, you still can create stuff. Capture movement in your images. Don't always freeze things, especially with water. Frozen water tends to be distracting. It's a noisy for the viewer. They tend to bounce around the scene unnecessarily. So slow down your shutter speeds to create a smoother surface. This is on Jekyll Island. It's about a five second exposure. And there was enough of waves and movement back and forth that it completely smoothed it out to look like ice. If I use, say, a shutter speed of even, say, a 15th of a second or a 30th of a second, you would have captured the ripples in the water. Um, you would have got a lot of movement. And between the type of cloudy sky it was and the movement in the water, you would have been taken away from the tree that's in, in the water itself. It just, your eye would have been bouncing around. So create a movement both to soften the water and be less distracting, but also to guide the viewer into the scene with, in this case, leading lines. This is Diamond Beach in Iceland. This is a beautiful spot. Uh, can be a little bit dangerous a spot. You gotta watch out because these waves can come in and kind of take your feet out from under you. But it is a very dramatic place with these icebergs that have went out into the ocean and then crashed back up on shore. And in the case of this, what we would do is to the best of our ability, set up a shot, get really, really close with the 15 to 30 in this case uh, to the ice itself to make them look bigger than they actually were. And as the water would come in, I wouldn't shoot then, the water would come up and then start retreating. I would wait about a second or two until I could start seeing a little bit more of the black sand, not just white, and then fire for about four seconds. And what that did is there was just enough water left in the foreground area to recede in this white foamy uh, formations that it created more of leading lines to the iceberg itself. If I captured it as it was coming in, you would have got a lot more of the middle of the frame here where it just looks like um, looks like kind of powder and clouds and stuff like that. It would be interesting, sure, but I just kind of liked the scene to have that contrast of white, uh, light and dark in the foreground, then the blue ice and then the water itself. So kind of a, a little bit more use that movement in, in the water. So with that being said, I want to really want to thank Camera co Camera Company for there's a lot of dealers out there. Camera Company for hosting this event. They are a great dealer, um, and a, a, a just a wonderful people to talk to. So if you have the opportunity to talk with them and get to know them, please do. What I am going to do now is if you have any questions, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Sometimes there's a, a lot of them, but I'll get to a number of them as much as I can. And if not, you can uh, contact me on Facebook or Instagram. I'll also give you my email that, you know, if you want to ask me questions, I will uh, answer them for you. My email address is Hubbard, as in H U B B A R D at tamron.com pretty simple so hubbard at tamron.com so the first question i have i'll start from the bottom and go up 
Uh, do you use circular polarizer, CPL filters, or neutral density filters in my work? Absolutely. Um, they are some truly essential equipment. Circular polarizers to create um, more contrast in the sky, make the skies bluer, clouds a little bit wider. Um, also to take out reflections in things, not only in, um, say, glass if you're shooting through a window, but it'll take out glare in water or glare on leaves. If you're shooting in a rainforest or something like that, it'll take off some of the, that glare there. So circular polarizers, definitely. Neutral density filters, also, yes, I use them. I'm shooting in bright light situations sometimes, and what and what the neutral density filters will allow me to do is slow down my shutter speed in the middle of the day even. If I'm at a waterfall, I can shoot a 20 second exposure with a dark enough neutral density filter and slow down my shutter speed. Oh, okay, I just I was just reading a heads up from someone, so that's cool, thank you. Um, Let's see, thank you for your presentation. Da, 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 da. Is there a question? If I could only have two lenses, oh man. If I could only have two lenses, which two would you recommend? Whew, that's a tough one. <laughs> Depending on the camera system that you have, um, I would say probably either way, um, either APS-C or crop sensor, I would say an all-in-one to cover everything. Like an 18, if you have a crop sensor, the 18 to 400 will be great because it's wide angle telephoto. It also does close up. It'll cover everything. You'll be able to shoot very quickly. You won't have to worry about changing. But I also would get something that has a faster aperture as well. Say a 17 to 50 in the crop sensor or a 28, 24 to 70 in the full frame. Sorry about that just to have something a little bit faster so you can shoot in lower light situations. And for landscapes that, for me, I shoot a full frame more often than not, uh, both, uh, eight, uh, both mirrorless and with DSLR. So that 24 to 70 is my go-to range for sure. It, it, is there better f-stop setting or exposure to use to capture the rays of light. Oh, so the, the, from the redwoods, the rays of light. Well, my first thought process there, believe it or not, this is, I'll go through the thought process. When I jumped out of the car, the first thing I thought about was depth of field. The depth of field I, you know, was most concerned with. I wanted a lot of depth of field. I wanted the tree grounds in the foreground in focus and everything going back as sharp as possible. So in this case, it wasn't so much for the rays of light. It was because of depth of field that I stopped down to say F11 or F16 to get a larger depth of field. It's not really gonna uh, affect the rays of light and how many you get. You could have shot that at f2.8. Your shutter speed would have been out the wazoo because it was so bright out. But you would still, they were so pronounced, those rays of the light that you would, have, you would have got them. It doesn't matter with the aperture. But that one was more of concerned with depth of field than anything else that I wanted to make sure. Uh, can you discuss your settings for these shots, hopefully? If there's anything particular somebody sent over, can you discuss um, the settings for these shots? This is being recorded and will be uh, posted by a camera company. And you can go back and view it again. And if there's anything specific, just email me. Um, and uh, I will be more than happy to answer you. The 2875 is full frame for Sony. Yes, that is correct. That's a full frame. The 2875 that I was showing was full frame for mirrorless systems. Let me put this up here so I look a little bit more at the camera. For these images, did you shoot with a full frame DSLR or APS-C? Uh, as you can tell, that was probably answered that I shoot everything. I shoot APS-C, I shoot full frame DSLR, and I shoot uh, full frame mirrorless. Currently, the least that I shoot is APS-C uh, mirrorless, but I do shoot a little bit of everything. When I'm going to go light, I'm either with my APS-C DSLR or full frame mirrorless. If I'm going full bore out there in, into whatever, 
I'm shooting my full frame DSLR. Um, and sometimes, to be honest with you, it dictates what Tamron needs for me, what type of images, what I take out to shoot as well. But I'm, I don't hesitate shooting any one over the other. So uh, whatever your comfort zone is or whatever your um, price zone is for equipment, you know, it's a lot different than 20 years ago. Uh, there are so many options today, and especially within those cost factors, it's it's pretty pretty awesome. Uh, how far from the rocks are you? Uh, I'm not sure which image that they're talking about in there, but uh, that is Timothy Smith. If you want to go back and email me that one, I could let you know. And there's a number of people that have very specific. Um, it's kind of hard to fit in a lot of information in a 45 minute period of time. So that's why I didn't really go to the questions as, as they were coming up. So anyone that is not specific to an image that they want, that they know which image, feel free to, uh, send me some questions. Uh, okay. What is the best way to avoid too much clutter from wood? plants besides moving around and changing your position go to a different spot <laughs> pretty much yeah it all dictates the location you're in um, I mean there are times where I did a lot of research and I was going to the first for the first time and I get there and I'm just like oh boy <laughs> this is not quite what I thought it was gonna be uh, so yeah it's just a matter of uh, kind of sometimes it's hiking sometimes it's just driving a car to a higher point in the road. So, and to be honest with you, there are points where I've been on shoots where I'm driving up a road going, I really hope this breaks better. I hope this opens up and it just never does. So unfortunately, um, yeah, it's usually just meaning to moving to a different location. I saw you use the 15 to 32 eight a lot. I've used the 17 to 28 as well. Yes, I do. Um, and that's for the Sony uh, they're talking about. I have been using the Sony more and more and more. Um, I do like the weight factor. Um, plus, we're producing more lenses for it. Uh, we just announced the 70 to 180 as well, and I know more will be on the way. Um, so to me, it was just getting more comfortable with the Sony camera itself. It definitely has the most in-depth menu system I've ever seen. I think somebody told me there's 120 something thousand combinations of settings within that camera. And to be honest, for me, that was a bit much. That was my only hesitation to jumping further and further into that Sony system. But the more I get comfortable with it, the more I'm really, really satisfied with it. And the weight factor is pretty awesome compared. So with that being said, I'm not sure if Steve uh, wanted to say something uh, before we left, but I know he has to run off soon. Uh, you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> uh, you're still on mute, but all right. Yeah, you're still muted, I think. Maybe I can take you off, I don't know. I don't think, uh, okay, I'm here. There you go. There uh, is. Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to mention real quick uh, about uh, some of the rebates that are going on right now on Tamron lenses. So if there's anything that is of interest, uh, please contact the camera company and have them uh, tell you all about the rebates. They're anywhere from about $50 up to $200 right now. And then there's also some special savings and, and um, there's a free filter promotion on select lenses where you get a, a high-end circular polarizer at no cost when you buy certain lenses. So please check with Ward at the camera company about all these savings. And I want to thank them for their, uh, their hosting this event and Ken for his time and expertise. And thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you again soon in another one. There's more of these coming. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing people in person. That's, what, <laughs> that's the day I'll enjoy, for sure. Thanks right. for coming along. Yeah.